My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a cardiologist in York. Today's video is on the subject of POTS. This video is entitled The Four Pillars of Management. Now, the first thing I'd like to say is that I'm no, by no means a, a world specialist on POTS. I haven't published anything. I haven't done any research in POTS. I'm not involved in writing any guidelines, etc. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is purely based on my experience. I have uh, thousands of patients with this particular condition. I've kind of taught myself um, and developed my own practice based on just uh, listening to patients and working with them to try and find solutions. Uh, so what I say may be at odds with uh, what you may read on Google or what some of your specialists say, uh, but I think that what I have developed over a period of time through my own experience is also valuable and I wanted to share that with you. Now, the POTS stands for Postural Orthostatic Tachycardia Syndrome. The textbook definition for this, and I think the textbook definition is incomplete and outdated, but I'll explain that in a second. Uh, the textbook definition is that patients with this condition find that they feel unwell with symptoms of tremulousness, dizziness, and heart palpitations when they stand up. On objective assessment, there's an exaggerated and sustained increase in heart rate greater than 30 beats per minute in adults and greater than 40 beats per minute in children compared to when the patient is lying down. It is also worth noting that the definition of POTS includes the fact that the blood pressure does not typically fall when the patient is standing up. The blood pressure is sustained, but the heart rate goes up in an exaggerated manner. Now, healthcare professionals around the world have therefore started seeing POTS as a condition that is only manifest when the patient stands up. And there is a lot of confusion because some doctors seem to think, oh, well, your blood pressure doesn't fall, so you don't have POTS. Well, in the definition of POTS, the blood pressure isn't meant to fall. The other thing to say is that people say, okay, well, you know, if your heart rate doesn't go up by more than 30 beats per minute when we test it, then you don't have POTS. This is also untrue because if you stand these patients up, you can get different responses. On one day, you may get a completely normal response. On another day, you may actually get a hypotensive response. The blood pressure falls. And on another day, you may get the typical POTS response where the blood pressure doesn't fall, but the heart rate goes up um, by several beats a minute. And therefore, my own understanding now has changed. And it is clear to me that POTS is not just a condition that manifests when patient stands. Uh, virtually all patients will complain of other debilitating symptoms, even when they're not standing. These symptoms include severe fatigue, lack of refreshing sleep, chest pain, breathlessness, brain fog, temperature dysregulation, pain, gut symptoms, including nausea, bloating, slow transit constipation, and even diarrhea, bladder symptoms as well, for some people, headaches. When uh, other things that patients describe are that they struggle to stand still. You know, if they're standing still, they feel very uncomfortable. They have to fidget or move around uh, because when they're standing still, they find that there's a lot of blood that pools in their legs and they actually start feeling dizzy. Patients will also describe that they feel worse when it is warm. Uh, women feel worse around their periods. They feel worse uh, when they're dehydrated. They feel worse when they're stressed. And they feel worse if they have a big carb-rich meal. In this sense, the term POTS, therefore, is too restrictive to capture all patients who suffer from the symptoms of POTS, as the symptoms can vary from day to day. And not all patients with this condition will consistently have the obligatory exaggerated rise in heart rate to confirm the diagnosis. And this is why I think the term POTS does patients a disservice because it implies that it's only a condition of standing up. And therefore, to the less experienced doctor, if you, if you have these, if you don't hit that kind of 30 beats per minute, uh, then uh, that's not POTS. And if you have all these other symptoms, then those are other conditions, right? So these patients, unfortunately, then go to the gut doctor and the doctor says, oh, you've got IBS. And then they go to the headache doctor and the headache doctor says, oh, you've got migraine. And then you go to uh, uh, the pain doctor and they say, oh, you have fibromyalgia. So they accrue a lot of different diagnoses. But I believe these are all one condition. 
okay, uh, which is manifesting in different organ systems uh, with different symptoms. Uh, I therefore believe that a better term for this condition is a dysautonomia, which basically means a disequilibrium between the flight and fight responses of the body and the rest and digest responses of the body. So patients with this condition will complain of always being in flight and fight mode and almost never in rest and digest mode. In a simplistic sense, if you ask them, they'll say, I always feel tired and wired. Um, they, in a very simplistic sense, you could say they produce too much adrenaline. Anything that produces adrenaline causes an exaggerated response in this patient, in these patients. And it's interesting because actually one of the things that a lot of patients will admit to is that they'll startle very easily. So if you go and sort of touch them from the back, they'll behave like, oh my God, I've been attacked because they get this exaggerated increase in adrenaline. And so unfortunately what happens is because they look okay, this is termed, this is put down to anxiety because they're reacting in a hyper-exaggerated manner. But it is not anxiety, it is not a mental overreaction, it is a biochemical overreaction due to adrenaline, due to sympathetic overdrive. And this is really important. The diagnosis of dysautonomia can easily be made by listening to the patient's history and if they describe the symptoms above and if they find that some of their symptoms are made worse when they're standing up, then a diagnosis of POTS slash dysautonomia can be entertained. And this may then be confirmed by doing a tilt test. However, it is also, again, very important to realize that whilst a tilt test can help confirm the diagnosis, I do not believe that a negative tilt test reliably excludes the diagnosis. Symptoms vary from day to day. So if you do the tilt test first in the morning, you'll get a different response to if you do it late in the evening. If you do it around a patient's periods, you'll get a much more exaggerated uh, response compared to when they're generally not in their periods. Um, also, medications can make a difference, etc. So just because a tilt test does not come back positive, it does not mean that the patient does not have this condition. And I've always taken the stance that you want to treat the patient. You don't want to treat a condition. You don't want to treat a test result. You want to treat the patient. And therefore, I base a lot of my diagnosis um, purely on what the patient tells me and then recognizing patterns. This is exactly what my last patient told me. And when I treated them, they got better. So why not try the same with this patient? And that's really important because, unfortunately, there may be a lot of patients who've been told that they don't have this condition on the basis of tilt test, uh, which is actually a flawed test. And therefore, uh, they may still be searching for answers when it could all have been POTS slash dysautonomia. Now, in terms of um, management, uh, I'm going to share what I do when I um, have patients. And I think there are four pillars to the management of POTS. And all four should be undertaken simultaneously to hasten recovery. My own belief is that I don't believe in the kind of passive approach, take this, come back in six months, let's try something else after six months, etc. These patients have already lost a lot of their lives looking for answers, being passed from pillar to post, being treated like they're mad. And, you know, quality of life matters. And of course, you know, some of these... Uh, patients are school children, they're going to college and they're missing out on really, really important years of their lives because they just feel so awful. So I don't think there's any time to waste. And I take, tend to take a very uh, active, aggressive approach to managing them. Um, I've broadly divided management in four different sections. I'll tell you a little bit about each one. The first is lifestyle modification. Um, it is important for patients to work on their lifestyle. So more hydration, more salt, six to 10 grams of salt a day. Um, electrolytes, a couple of sachets of electrolytes a day, a low carb diet, a low histamine diet, compression garments, keeping cool, uh, recognizing symptoms of dizziness and trying to lie down wherever possible. Um, I think also cold water baths are very good because a lot of patients say that they feel so much worse in heat because it opens up their blood vessels. So cold water, cold water plungers can be quite helpful as well. Um, those are the kind of lifestyle modifications. I have to say, 
I found just lifestyle change to make an underwhelming, um, to have an underwhelming effect on well-being. So I would say it makes like a five to ten percent improvements in symptoms. Uh, I've done a comprehensive video on lifestyle changes that can help symptoms. This can be accessed on my YouTube channel, which is uh, Your Cardiology. Uh, the second is medications. The aim of medications is twofold. The first is to reduce the standing heart rate. Uh, medications that can help with this include beta blockers and another medication called ibobradin. Now, beta blockers are medications that cardiologists feel very comfortable with, so they tend to be the first one that is given. Um, but actually, beta blockers are not as good as ibobradin. In general, um, you know, um, beta blockers make you more tired, they uh, blunt, completely blunt the adrenaline response. So a lot of people actually find that they go the other way. They feel more tired. They feel a bit more zombified. And beta blockers drop your blood pressure. And a lot of POTS patients run a low blood pressure anyway all the time. And therefore, ibobradin is much better because ibobradin doesn't lower the blood pressure and is much better suited to lowering the heart rate without any of the other negative adverse effects. There are some patient groups in whom beta blockers will be preferred, such as pregnant women or children. Uh, but generally, my first line medication is ibobradin. And then the next step, apart from sort of lowering the heart rate, is to increase the circulating plasma volume and venous return of the blood to the heart. And there are other medications that do this including something called fludrocortisone or Florinef, which actually tells the kidneys to absorb more salt and water, therefore increasing the amount of blood volume. And there's another medication called Midodrin, and Midodrin actually compresses your blood vessels in your legs, pushing more blood up to the brain. It's a bit like compression stockings in a drug form. Um, and I tend to use midodrine more than fludrocortisone, and in general it works well. A lot of people feel less dizzy. Certainly those people who tend to faint with POTS don't faint as much. There are other medications I use as well. Um, one of them is something called mestinon pyridostigmine. This is a rest and digest enhancer. So the ibobradin, the beta blocker, are basically telling the heart rate, telling the sympathetic system, the flight and fight system to calm down but mestinon increases the rest and digest system. And a lot of people find that that makes them feel more rested and it's very good to improve digestion, making the gut move as well. Uh, another medication I've started using increasing is low-dose naltrexone. Low-dose naltrexone is a gentle anti-inflammatory and can be very helpful for fatigue and post-exertional malaise as well. So when I come across patients, I would give them ivabradin and I would say, try this. And then after two or three weeks of acclimatizing, add in some uh, midodrine. And after another two to three weeks of acclimatization, add in the mestinon. And then after another two to three weeks, add in the low-dose naltrexone. Of course, patients are concerned about polypharmacy. They say, well, we don't like taking tablets. Now suddenly you're telling us to take four different tablets. And my uh, response is that, you know, the point is this, that the medications are there purely to improve quality of life and the patient can measure their quality of life. So those medications that improve your quality of life continue with and those that are not making a difference, you can stop. <coughs> but this is all about your subjective assessment of quality of life. <coughs> Sorry. And if um, uh, your quality of life improves, well, that's where we want to be. The other thing to say is you're not stuck with these medications for the rest of your life. You know, the medications are a bridge to get you to the destination, which is lifestyle modification, uh, conditioning, etc. Uh, and once you get there, once you feel better with the medications, you could engage, you could get your social life back, you can get more conditioned, you could change your lifestyle, and then you can slowly wean off the medication. So you're not stuck with the medications for the rest of your life. Then um, there, physiotherapy. Physiotherapy is vital. It's um, 
patients with POTS become extremely deconditioned, which makes their symptoms a lot worse. And regular physiotherapy can be as effective as medications at improving symptoms and overall quality of life. The problem with physiotherapy is it's not easily accessible. So it's not like you can have someone training you every day. And you also need that right person, the person who understands this condition. And uh, fortunately, I've linked up with a few uh, patients who were physiotherapists who then developed this condition and um, who are very empathic uh, to the needs of fellow sufferers. Uh, so all my patients will get uh, an a, a appointment with a physiotherapist who has POTS themselves and therefore can give them the right kind of exercises to do. And then the fourth thing, which I think is really, really important is uh, social or workplace-based adjustments and rehabilitation. You know, the thing with a condition like this, a chronic condition, is it strips patients of their identity. And what are we without our identity? So once you've made a diagnosis, I truly believe that the doctor should go out of their way to be that patient's advocate and um, help them reclaim that identity. So we would often, I would often liaise with employers and schools to facilitate adjustments such as um, flexible working, late starts for students, you know, ask, letting their university know that this student may have worked really, really hard throughout the term despite the challenges that their health poses. Uh, but on the day of the exam, they may not necessarily perform very well because they may have brain fog um, or not be well enough to do it and therefore a greater emphasis on coursework based assessment rather than times exams can be helpful. A lot of patients uh, struggle with getting um, income protection, PIP, PIP and so uh, a POT specialist can write to um, the authorities and help facilitate this. And all those things go some way in making that person's overall quality of life better. So I hope you found this useful. Um, more on POTS can be found on my YouTube channel, Your Cardiology. I have set up a website called potspecialist.com, P-O-T-S, specialist.com. And I've got a lot of resources on that website. So, you know, you may have a GP who um, is very sympathetic to your needs, et cetera, who believes in the condition, et cetera, but it may just be a real struggle for them to try and formulate a letter to your employer, et cetera. Well, we've put all those templates on that website so you can freely download them, show them to your GP and say, look, could you just sign this? Because if I could show this to my employer, they'll understand my needs better, which will allow me to be a better employee but also not compromise on my health. So all those are freely available. Just go onto the website, download whatever you can. And I hope some of this will be useful for you. Uh, in any case, thank you so much once again for listening and I wish you all the best.